Hey everyone, welcome to this lesson 66 of Wednesdays with Ewad. This is me, Shanti Kumaraswamy Street from English with a Twist, your business English trainer. Um, it is the 16th of May, just in case you're wondering what day it is, where are we? We're on planet Earth and I am here in the UK, um, in uh, Southeast London. Hi Keiko, lovely to see you. And uh, so as you're tuning in, if you're managing to tune in, please say hi because I'd love to see who's here. I can see Jen from Malaysia is here. Lovely to see you, Jen. Thanks so much for joining in. So what have we got for today's lesson? We have a lot of work to do, actually. So before I start, I want to make sure that you have notebook and a pen because you're going to be doing some listening with me and I'm going to be giving you some questions you need to answer when I, um, um, as you listen to what I have to say. So, but I, before I start, I want to say, um, how's everyone, how everyone is and, um, and also to remind you that if you haven't signed up to the English with a Twist, blog then do sign up today englishwithatwist.com i'd love to see you there because you'd be receiving all my audio blogs every friday and much more thank you for to keiko and also to susan for saying um about um wanting to see the business idiom um to a business mm, business idiom and coffee to go um idiom series that i have um, because I've been I've been running that since October 2016 and I just wondered whether the club would want to see that on a regular basis. Now both of you have uh, replied, others have seen but have not actually told me whether you want to see this. So it's a collection of all the idioms, these one minute videos I put together on business idioms. If you do want to see them then I will um, continue sharing with you. I might go back into the archives and share that. So today, in today's lesson, we are going back to our theme of decision making. So decisions. Hello, Anna. Lovely to see you. So glad you can tune in to today's lesson. Uh, Anna, you were famous because, you know, we I talked about um, your um, how you answered the question about how native speakers, how you feel uncomfortable when a native speaker enters a room or is in the, involved in a meeting of yours with work. And it was interesting because I started that discussion, but it was very quiet on that discussion thread, apart from Susan and I think someone else, I can't remember, Belen, Belen sh uh, shared with us. Um, so, um, you know, so it was, um, so I'm hoping that that discussion thread will continue as and when you have more time to share. Jen, I'm so glad you like the business idiom, so good idea. I will uh, start to introduce that into the club on a more regular basis. Right, as I said, hi Susan, lovely to see you. And thanks so much for your uh, contribution into the club. And I'm so glad that you and Aria are enjoying the practical usage by, um, practical English usage by Michael Swan. Okay, back to our themes. Remember this month we're talking about negotiations and decision making. Now, last week we looked at negotiations and this week I'm going to go back into decision making. Now, if you remember, if you remember way back at the beginning of May, we looked at a challenge on that life and death situation. And then we talked about uh, decision making. And I also shared that in my blog post. Uh, last week we looked at negotiations and this week I want to look at more decision making. Hi Gabby and hello Vasiliki, lovely to see you here. So good to see you guys and that you are, thank you for, you know, taking your time out to, um, to tune in. Now let's see, we're going to look at today in decision making. So um, just to remind you, please have a pen and paper because you're going to be writing down some questions that I want you to think about as I'm reading something out. So you're going to have some listening skills here. We're going to start with, we're going to look at decision making in terms of crisis management. So in businesses, unfortunately, there's always going to be some form of crisis, hopefully not too serious, but occasionally we have those serious issues. And I want to ask you, that, and you might not be directly involved in business, but if you have business clients, then what are the uh, more recent cases of crisis management 
that companies have had or that you've heard of. So I'm thinking of like, for example, you know, you can think of the sort of um, crisis that companies could face. That could be accusations of fraud. Um, that could be um, an anti-globalization protest. That could be an environmental disaster. So there's a big crisis, a hostile takeover bid. Um, we could have an investigation by the Monopolies Commission. So, you know, we, for example, here, we just recently had um, the announcement that Sainsbury's and Asda, who are the two big um, uh, supermarkets, are merging. Now, Sainsbury's is one of our big four, as we would call them. And Asda is owned by Walmart, which is the largest uh, um, supermarket in the United States. But, you know, there's been concerns that this could become a monopoly if they take on two, you know, they take a huge chunk of the retail market, you know, the supermarket market, a uh, supermarket market, pardon the pun. Um, so, you know, so that could be a crisis. That could be a lawsuit or that could be mass redundancies, which, you know, we hear about, unfortunately, in um, in our business world in, in these days. So... If you are people who, if you are those who follow business news and if you are in the business world, then I would urge you and presumably it is a good idea to always follow business news. Then more recently, have you had any, uh, have you heard of any particular crisis occurring in the world of business where you are? So I'm thinking Gabi in Argentina, Keiko in Myanmar, um, Susan in Germany. Uh, you know, where Jen, Malaysia, well, Jen, we've had lots of things going on in Malaysia, right? Big elections last week, Maharti coming back, Anwar, who's been, but those are not really crises, but there was a crisis before, and hopefully we are untangling that. But that's politics, we're not going to discuss politics. So a lot of stuff that's been happening. So I wonder if you want to share with me in the chat box what more recently, what crisis, um, you know, any business crisis as it occurred, where these companies are now need to manage the crisis and solve that crisis. Um, so do share me with me. I'm just going to refresh my page so I can see more clearly the comments that you could be sharing with me. Um, so let's see, let's see. Um, yeah, you might, you know, the thoughts might not be coming to your mind straight away, but as you it comes along, do, do let me know. Um, you know, here we've had, lo you know, we've had, you know, we know, well, we've got Brexit as one big crisis. <laughs> one big, you know, big thing that keeps going and keeps driving us all mad. Um, but, you know, there are also, in terms of the business world, we have where we had a, a more uh, earlier on in the year, we had a big company called Carillion who went into... Um, into liquidation so they went bankrupt and they manage a lot of contracts across the UK and that's going to have a huge impact on people on projects on uh, people's lives uh, people's jobs so that's a lot of crisis which of course involves also the government in crisis management and of course crisis management with crisis management comes decision making so then some key decisions that um, businesses have to make in a crisis and so this is when everyone has to come together they have to manage the crisis they have to discuss the, the, the crisis um, and then solve the crisis and a lot of decisions have to be made a lot of decisions have to be taken you can use either made or taken Susan you're saying the German car industry has a crisis with their diesel emission levels yeah I remember the famous VW um, uh, case where it came out that VW hadn't been, um, they hadn't been open, they hadn't been transparent with the uh, diesel emission levels. And this was discovered in the States, didn't, wasn't it? And so this was a big crisis. And of course, the German car industry is a huge part of the country's GDP. Uh, and, you know, people, you know, the, the German cars, the whole brand, the whole, um, trustworthiness you know you buy a German car it equals um, trustworthiness reliability so suddenly to have this reputation completely killed by this omission to 
tell people about the diesel you know they were i think that what were they try i cannot remember exactly but they they um i think they massaged the figures in terms of car emission levels uh, diesel particularly now of course diesel is the bad the bad form of car that we can use bad fuel that we are using for the environment of course years ago it was perfectly fine and now everyone with a car a diesel car is is polluting the environment even more so you know it's it's um you know it's really uh you know these are all the different crises that of course companies have to manage we then of course have oil spills so where you've had bp oil spills and you know that has a huge impact on the environment and on, on, on people so i can see rosie's also joined good afternoon rosie lovely to see you so so crisis management with crisis management comes very key decisions important and serious decisions that have to be made so today's class you're going to be really involved now I have taken today's idea from one of the course books now I don't normally teach with course books uh, I don't like that I prefer to use my clients and you know there's such a wealth of information outside but every now and again it's useful to you know dip into those course books and get some case studies and I like that because maybe I don't have much time to put together an entire case study myself, so I, I'll dip into a book. And one of the books I like is, um, this is to do with Business English, and it's Mark Powell's um, uh, books uh, entitled, entitled, and I can't remember now, In Company. Gosh, my mind went to blank for a moment. So I'm going to look at a case study here, and it's all to do with decision making. And it is about a um, crisis that occurred to Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola Company. And this is way back in 1999. Wow. Um, and so it is a famous brand, the world fame, world's most famous brand, and it is in trouble. So I'm going to read you two passages from this. Uh, don't worry, I'll be sharing with you the link um, where I got this information and also. And this this is also going to be part of the next challenge in the club okay so if you're up to the challenge then there'll be a part two uh, from this class right so what you're going to do is uh, this is in two parts the first part i'm going to read out but there are some questions i want you to think about and answer whilst you're listening uh, and then the next part i will read again and listen and there are more questions you need to answer so first of all, you need to think, OK, so we are talking about Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is in trouble. This is in May 1999. And there is a crisis and management consultants are discussing what needs to be done. Now, in the first part, you have five questions you need to consider as you are listening to me. Here are your five questions and I'm going to give you some time to make a note of them, okay? So here goes. How many Cokes are sold each day? So how many Coca-Cola bottles or tins or whatever are sold each day? So these are the questions that you will answer as you listen, okay? So how many Cokes are sold each day? Two, how would you describe Coca-Cola's advertising strategy? So how would you describe Coca-Cola's advertising strategy? Three, what had just happened? What had just happened? happened don't forget you will find out when i read this okay so three what had just happened four which markets are directly involved in the crisis so which markets are directly involved in the crisis and five calculate so you'll need your calculator out how much those markets are worth in annual sales calculate how much those markets are worth 
in annual sales? Let me repeat the questions. How many Cokes are sold each day? How would you describe Coca-Cola's advertising strategy? What had just happened? Which markets are directly involved in the crisis? Calculate how much those markets are worth in annual sales. I will ask those questions again later. Let me just have a slurp of water here. Everyone okay with the five questions? Give me a thumbs up. Do you need me to repeat any of the questions? Just going to give you a second or two to reply in the in the um, chat box. For those who are going to be listening to the recording, I'll have a copy of those questions so you can follow them easily. Yeah, I, I take it. If other, give me a thumbs up. Give me a hey, yeah, cool. Yeah, Anna Vasiliki. Um, I think Rosie said yes. Cool. Okay, let's go. Shall we? Very busy today. Very busy. Very. You are. You have no time to relax in this class today. Oh, I've just torn my book a bit. Oh dear, dear. All right. I will read as slowly as I can. Great, Keiko. Excellent. I'm going to read as slowly as I can so that you can follow me and answer the question. So this is also some good listening practice. Although you do get a lot of listening practice in this class. Right. Here goes. The mighty Coca-Cola has been the world's number one brand for so long. It's hard to imagine anything threatening its position of global dominance. I'll just put this in front of me better. One of the company's own publicity brochures proudly declares, A billion hours ago, human life appeared on Earth. A billion minutes ago, Christianity emerged. A billion seconds ago, the Beatles performed on The Ed Sullivan Show. A billion servings of Coca-Cola ago was yesterday morning. Quite a claim and one that makes a loss of consumer confidence unthinkable. But take yourself back to May 1999. The unthinkable has just happened. Hundreds of people in Belgium and France have become ill after drinking what they claim is contaminated coke. And when the cause of the problem cannot quickly be established, the famous soft drink is officially banned in both countries as well as Luxembourg and the Netherlands. The price you pay for being the brand leader is that customers expect quality, as Coca-Cola's CEO is the first to admit. For 113 years, he says, our success has been based on the trust that consumers have in that quality. Now that trust is shaken. In fact, the four countries banning Coke only represent 2% of the company's $18.8 billion in annual sales. But within a week, consignments exported from Belgium to other countries as far apart as Germany and the Ivory Coast have also been seized by officials. Though no definite proof of contamination has yet been found, 
the panic is starting to spread. How was that? Did I speak slowly enough? Were you able to follow that? Let me know. And the chat box, was that okay? Do you need me to read it again? Tell me. So tell me, yes, read it again. No, it's fine. So yes, read again. No, no need. Okay, Vasily is saying read absolutely okay or read absolutely okay. So I don't need to read it again. No need. Okay, great. Thank you, Vasiliki. Keiko, Susan, Alessandra, Rosie, Anna, no need. Good. Okay. Wonderful. So you're excellent listeners, folks. Wonderful. Okay. So your questions. How many Cokes are sold each day? What? Do you remember what it said, what I said? How many Cokes are sold each day? Oh, Gabby, you want me to read it again? Okay, all right. So I've got the consensus, we're halfway. Okay, so it's a mixture. All right, let me read it again for the benefit of Keiko and Gabby. Uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, the other ladies, could you you can you can go ahead and and answer the questions, right? But I'll just read it through. Okay, Anna, great, a billion. Okay, let me read this um, through. The mighty Coca Cola has been the world's number one brand for so long. It's hard to imagine anything threatening its position of global dominance. One of the company's own publicity brochures proudly declares, a billion hours ago, human life appeared on Earth. A billion minutes ago, Christianity emerged. A billion seconds ago, the Beatles performed on the Ed Sullivan Show. And a billion servings of Coca-Cola ago was yesterday morning. So Anna's right, a billion servings. Quite a claim and one that makes a loss of consumer confidence unthinkable. But take yourself back to May 1999. The unthinkable has just happened. Hundreds of people in Belgium and France have become ill after drinking what they claim is contaminated Coke. And when the cause of the problem cannot quickly be established, the famous soft drink is officially banned in both countries for being, oh, did I go too fast? No, for being um, in both countries as well as Luxembourg and Netherlands. Did I read that correctly or did I read that too fast? Hundreds of people in Belgium have become what they claim is contempt and when the chaos of the problem cannot quickly be established, the famous soft drink is officially banned in both countries as well as Luxembourg and the Netherlands. The price you pay for being the brand leader is that customers expect quality, as Coca-Cola CEO is the first to admit. For 113 years, our success has been based on the trust that consumers have in that quality. Now that trust is shaken. In fact, the four countries banning Coke only represent 2% of the company's 18.8 billion in annual sales. But within a week, Consignments exported from Belgium to other countries as far apart as Germany and the Ivory Coast have also been seized by officials. Though no definite proof of contamination has yet been found, the panic is starting to spread. So the first question was how many, how many um, Cokes are sold each day? And Vasiliki and Anna said a billion servings. Yes. 
So we came from this billion servings of Coca-Cola ago was yesterday morning. Great. Uh, next question was, how would you describe Coca-Cola's advertising strategy? So here's, let me remind you, it's a billion hours ago, human life appeared on earth. A billion minutes ago, Christianity emerged. A billion seconds ago, the Beatles performed out on the Ed Sullivan show. And a billion seconds, serv uh, a billion second servings of Coca-Cola ago was yesterday morning. So well, how would you describe the, ad the advertising strategy? Any adjectives that would come up to you? You know, what are they? Are they, are they quite, um, is it low key? Is it, you know, how would you describe it? Number three, maybe I'll give you some thoughts on number three. Pompous, Susan, interesting, pompous, right, okay. Ad aggressive also, yeah, yeah, pomp yeah, pompous, right? So like, hey, we're, we're number one, guys. Call it customers' feelings, trust, expect quality. Um, yeah, so, you know, aggressive, pompous. Would you say it's powerful? Would you say it's like, oh, yeah, a billion, a billion, here we are. You know, using that billion dollars. Um, yeah. Pompous, so that's what you 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 think. Yeah, um, I suppose big brands, they get that, and then suddenly there's a crisis, and suddenly they come right down. Um, okay, number three was what has just happened, or what, yeah, ha had just happened. So what has just happened? May nineteen ninety nine. Gabby, yes, one billion servings, yes, exactly. So what's happened? So there's been some contamination. They found contamination in Coke. And which markets have been directly involved by the crisis? So people fell ill through contamination. Contaminated Coke. Um, hundreds of people, hundreds of people. Yes, Keiko, not a hundred of people, hundreds, so it's S. Not 100 people, but hundreds of people. Um, got ill after drinking Coke. Great. And in which markets, which markets were, um, were affected? Yeah, Belgium, France, Luxembourg, and Netherlands. So the people who actually got ill were in Belgium and France, but Luxembourg and Netherlands decided to also ban um, Coke because I, they were taking preventive preventative measures just in case. You know, they, they didn't want the situation happening. So the the um, the people who got ill were actually in Belgium and France, but then Luxembourg and the Netherlands decided to. Um, ban it because nobody could tell what was causing the contamination. No, that's fine, Keiko. No problem. No need to say sorry. Hundreds. Great. Excellent. Okay. And calculate how much those markets are worth in annual sales. So we're talking about these four markets. Um, and here they said they represent 2% um, of the company's 18.8 billion. So how much do they represent of this entire figure? So this is where we need our calculators out. But so, you know, we can just come up with a figure, right? It's just 2% of the 18.8. And if you're very good at maths, um, yeah, Gabi, yeah, they use an aggressive, effective, interesting, you know, sometimes aggressive is effective campaign. Sometimes it works against you. But yes, it's it's aggressive. Yeah, it's not hiding behind their their brand. They're proud of it and they're going to share it. 
Yeah. So two percent. They so these four markets represent two percent of uh, the um, world market, the annual sales of eighteen point eight billion. And because I've got the answer here, two percent of eighteen point eight billion is three hundred and seventy six million dollars. Three hundred seventy six million dollars. Yeah. So two percent. So from a company's point of view. 2% is significant, or can you just say, well, yeah, they're unimportant, who knows, but interesting, good to know, four markets, but it's a very small proportion of that. Great, now we have to move on to the next part, because this is not over yet. Now we're going to listen to the second part of the case, but I have a few more questions that you need to answer. And here are your next five questions. First question. Make a note, please. What do the following figures refer to? Plus 25%, minus 13%. So what do the following figures refer to? Plus 25%, minus 13%. You just need to know what those figures are and then I'll read it out and you can answer. Two, what is the significance of these figures? So in other words, what do they mean? What is the significance of these two figures? Three, what have the inspectors of the Belgian bottling plant found? So what have the inspectors at the Belgian bottling plant found. Four, what is the toxicologist's verdict? So the, what is the toxicologist's verdict? Toxicology is the person who investigates poison. So toxins, toxic is poison. So what is their verdict on these bottles on this coke and finally who is benefiting from coca-cola's current problems you know when there's a crisis there's always someone who benefits so who is benefiting from coca-cola's current problems so one what do these two figures what what do they refer to 25 percent plus and minus 13%. What is the significance of these two figures? What have the inspectors at the Belgian bottling plant found? What is the toxicologist's verdict? And who is benefiting from Coca-Cola's current problem? We good to go? Can we, shall I continue? Yeah. Okay, so this is a smaller part, so you know it's not going to be so long. So I'm going to read this out. All right. 1999 is not a good year for soft drinks companies. Though the Dow is up 25%, both Coke and Pepsi, normally well ahead of the market, are down by around 13%. Coca-Cola is not going to rush into a highly expensive product recall. In any case, early examinations of the Belgian bottling plants find nothing unusual and an official toxicologist report concludes that the 200 cases of sickness are probably psychosomatic. But while Coca-Cola is deliberating over what action to take, rivals Pepsi and Virgin Cola are quick to fill the gaps left on the supermarket shelves. And Coke's refusal to react until it has conducted a thorough investigation is starting to look like a denial of responsibility. 
Okay, I'm going to reread this so that you can follow. Hi, Lula, lovely, Luba, lovely to see you. And hi, Manisha, thanks for watching. Okay, so this bit, let me read it. Um, the, Gabi, the contamination happened in Belgium and France. Netherlands and Luxembourg decided to ban um, coke just in case. They were ju doing it to prevent um, uh, the, uh, cases of illness. Okay, let me reread this. 1999 is not a good year for soft drinks companies. Though the Dow is up 25%, both Coke and Pepsi, normally well ahead of the market, are down by 13%. Coca-Cola is not going to rush into a highly expensive product recall. In any case, Early examinations of the Belgian bottling plants find nothing unusual and an official toxicologist report concludes that the 200 cases of sickness are probably psychosomatic. But while Coca-Cola is deliberating over what action to take, rivals Pepsi and Virgin Cola are quick to fill the gaps left on the supermarket shelves and Coke's refusal to react until it has conducted a thorough investigation is starting to look like a denial of responsibility. So there you have it folks. It's amazing how no matter how many times we see these crises companies never learn. So let's looking at the first question what is, what do the following figures refer to? Up 25%, down 13%. So what's up 25%? So do you know I said it was, um, what, what did I say? What was up 25% and what is down 13%? So what do the figures refer to? Are you still with me? The Dow. The, the Dow is what, Susan? No, I mean the figure. What figure is um, related to the Dow? 25% or 13%? Right, yeah, the Dow is up 25%, but the market price, share prices for Pepsi and Coca-Cola are down by 13%. Excellent, Keiko. Yeah, exactly. So what is the Dow? What, when we talk about the Dow, does anyone know what the Dow is referring to? This is for my business clients, people who know about the markets. The Dow is the Dow Jones Index. It's the index that is um, the, one of the United States index. The Dow Jones tracks the top 100 um, uh, companies in the US. The other one we have is the Standard and Poor's Index, which is the larger, the larger one. So the Dow Jones is the market where the top, the leading companies are. Um, 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 oh gosh, I'm, I've forgotten my words now. They are um, they they play they're on the. Um, on the market, I can't think of my word, so sorry. See, it happens to all of us, we can't remember the, the word. They're quoted, sorry, that's the word I wanted to think of. They're quoted on the stock exchange, the Dow Jones. So the Dow Jones is up, so the market is up, the market is up, but Coca-Cola and Pepsi are down by 13%. So the market, they've lost market um, share. They've lost their, 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 um, their prices, the prices down. So Coca-Cola is now not going to get involved in an expensive product recall. Um, so here's some useful language here with product recall. 
Um, so what is the significance of the figures though? What is the significance? As I said, you know, the market is up and despite the market being up, Coca-Cola and Pepsi have seen their market price go down. So they're underperforming the market. So it has been eff affected by this crisis. And what have the inspectors at the Belgian bottling plant um, found? What did they find when they started inspecting the, um, the bottles? What did they find? I'm not thinking of the toxicologists, I'm thinking of the Belgian inspectors at the bottling plant. Hi Clay, lovely to see you. Yes, um, Gabi, 13% in the losses, the, the, the fall in the market price, the fall in their share price. So they lost, yes, share price loss. Yeah, so not losses as in profits. They didn't necessarily lose profits. Well, I'm sure it would have had an uh, effect. But at that point, when you're looking at where the market is and where the, 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 the companies are, so it's a fall in market price and the share price. So they see a fall in their share price. But yes, it then does have an effect on their profit margins. No, but what? Yes, Keiko. So the 200 bottles, but what did they find? Did they find them? No, they didn't find anything unusual. They didn't find anything. They didn't see any proof, nothing unusual in the bottling, in the bottles. And what did the toxicologist report say about these 200 cases? Did the toxicologist report found that what? That these cases were probably, cases of sickness were probably psychosomatic. So they use the word psychosomatic. And what does that mean? Does, um, um, psychosomatic. was all in their imagination. Yeah, so when something is psychosomatic, it's to do with your psyche. So it's to do with, you know, you're imagining that you're feeling sick. Um, so interesting, really. The toxicologist reports that didn't find any traces of any toxins, anything that could have caused this illness. But, wow, it's funny, isn't it? 200 cases, all of them being psychosomatic? Um, yeah, just curious, I wonder. All of them, imagine, it's all in their imagination. You know, this is before social media, right? So, I mean, well, everyone's get, getting this rumor. But I suppose sometimes, you know, you think, oh, I feel sick. And then you think, oh, maybe I also feel sick. And then, you know, it starts spreading. Who knows? But anyway, the toxicologist report says it was psychosomatic. So it's all in their imagination. So who is benefiting from Coca-Cola's problems? Of course, it's going to be their rivals, right? So their rivals, their main rivals at the time were Pepsi and Virgin Cola. Is there still Virgin Cola around? I mean, I don't think, we're talking 1999 here. So if we look at 2018 now, maybe we would have Dr. Peppers or something like that. But yeah, so Pepsi and Virgin are very quick to go in there and, you know, take advantage of the fact that um, Coca-Cola bottles have been removed from the supermarket shelves. So they got in there and they did it. Uh, yeah, Pepsi and Virgin Cola. Um, I don't know whether, I don't think Virgin Cola exists anymore. Yeah, exactly. So it's interesting. So, and Coke's refusal to react until it has conducted a thorough investigation is starting to look like a denial of responsibility. <gasps> Susan, maybe it was an undercover sabotage by the rivals. Hey, good point. Could have been that, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe, you know, we, we do have sabotage, um, industrial, commercial, corporate sabotage in the world. And, uh, you know, it's not just political sabotage. So that's interesting. Could be, could be, who knows? Intrigue, intrigue. Um, the denial of responsibility. 
Uh, it's interesting that we've had lots of cases, haven't we, in, um, in business where companies who don't, you know, accept responsibility fairly quickly, even if there are no, there is no proof. But, you know, one of the biggest things is to actually accept responsibility. The more you continue to deny, the more people feel you've got something to hide or that, you know, you just, you, you're not going, you know, you just, um, it, it can really damage your reputation. So, for example, with the VW case, I think for a while they were denying responsibility. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't look good. Nobody, your, your customers don't accept that. More recently, what case did we have recently? Facebook, right? What's been happening with Facebook and all this Cambridge Analytica, what's going on with data? And, you know, and, and if Facebook didn't stand up and say, hey, OK, yes, we've made mistakes. These days, customers will um, will um, vote with their with their money. They will vote also with their feet. We say with their vote with their feet, which means they will leave. Um, and if you don't stand up and accept responsibility um, and try and, 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 and solve an issue, sell, salvage your credibility, then your brand is, is, is ruined for a long time. And it takes a long time to, to uh, come back. VW has had a huge, um, has seen their reputation really, really damaged uh, by not accepting responsibility straight away. So it's, you know, that denial of responsibility. Um, what do you say? I mean, I mean, have you have you seen cases like this in your countries? You know, the more you deny responsibility, the more people um, uh, lose respect for you. Um, because, I mean, although here the toxicologist report, I don't know, I can't believe that there were no just two, no 200 cases not one was um, you know a problem so it's all psychosomatic but hey this is just a case study but uh, you know it'd be very interesting um, to see but what are your thoughts on that what do you think you know when companies make mistakes and there's a huge crisis of confidence and of trust it's a big brand um, you know more recently you know a few years ago we had this with Nike didn't we and with Gap where it, it 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 came out that they were you they were they were using um, underpaid um, workers in the Far East in you know in in Asian countries and their working conditions were um, you know terrible absolutely terrible and they fell well beneath workers conditions human rights conditions and now Nike and Gap you know, pretended, well, well, we never knew, but people don't accept that. You have to know. You have, you can, ignorance is not a, you know, um, um, ignorance is not a defense. In a court of law, it's not a defense. You can't pretend, well, I didn't know. No, nope. you, you have to take responsibility and you then have to make um, decisions and communicate those decisions to your consumers. Otherwise, they will no longer trust your brand and you build you spend years building a brand and if you lose trust it takes another lot of years more years to rebuild them uh, as you're saying Luba how independent was the report exactly you're thinking who commissioned the report right we have this so much right in our in our daily lives in our political lives in our you know that you the people commission reports but then you wonder who it is who did that even medical reports I don't know about yourselves but how many times do we have you know reports of you know, if you eat two cucumbers a day, that will make you, you know, it will stop you from getting cancer. The next day it's, well, if you, you know, it's always about this drinking, eating, and one report will tell you this, another scientific report will tell you that. And, and you think, well, I mean, how, what am I supposed to believe? And then you think, well, who commissioned those reports? If it's a big pharmaceutical company or if it's a, if it's a big um, company like a, a food company or a drinks company, then you're thinking, well, what is the ultimate, what is the objective? What are they trying to get there? What are they trying to sell us at the end of the day? 
So is this, uh, uh, is this um, uh, report meant to get you out there to buy more of whatever they're trying to sell you? So they commission this report and so there's a study and then tells you, well, you know, drinking two glasses of wine each day is very good, beneficial for you. And the next week it tells you, well, one glass, even one glass of red wine a day could damage or could shorten your life by five years. And I think, oh my goodness, is this just too much? I, I just don't know what to believe. But there you go. Hey, that's another, that's for another uh, lesson. Now, here's the, the challenge. Oh, sorry, Gabby. I'm so sorry yet again. You're having difficulties with the internet connection. Oh, that's uh, such a shame. But thank you so much. But you've been with us. And hopefully you can pick up the recording uh, later on. But here's what I want to do. Um, what I'm going to be doing is with this. And so we have this crisis here with Coca-Cola. And for a board of directors or for a company, a management, they have decisions they're going to have to make. They've got to manage this crisis and they've got to somehow try and solve this crisis. So lots of decisions that have to be made in this situation. And what I want you to do, um, if you're willing to take on the next challenge, and I'll be posting it in the club here, is that you are going to decide what recommendations. So imagine your management consultants to Coca-Cola and you've got this this um, this crisis and you are going to put forward some recommendations to your client and so as well as the information that I shared and so I'm going to I'm going to put it in an audio recording so you can listen to it and um, or just write it out in a document for you and then also you're going to have an extra article um, that you need to read about and then you're going to put together your recommendations on what Coca-Cola needs to do to um, solve, to manage this crisis in a way that is going to be uh, beneficial to them, to their brand and to rebuilding trust in the brand. How does that sound? What do you think? Is that a challenge that you'd like to take on? What do you think? I, I, I thought, you know, you could then present your recommendation to the group through a written report. So you have here, so what would you, if you were management consultants, what would you tell Coca-Cola they need to do? So how would you decide? Yeah, so you're making decisions yourself. So there's a lot of decision making that needs to be made. Are you up for that challenge? Let me know. Can you put that in the comments box? I'm in. If you are, then I will prepare the challenge. If you think, nah, can we try something else? Then fine, I'll put together a different challenge. Sound good? So what I'm going to do is, let me remind you, is you're going to think about what recommendations you'd put forward to Coca-Cola um, and what they need, in terms of what they need to do. I will give you a copy of what you've just heard and also an extra article that you need to read. And you put forward your recommendations and put it forward and share it with the group in a, um, in a document of what you would say. There's no right or wrong answer. It's you saying, this are the decisions they need to make. And this is the decisions and how they need to communicate them. Nasiliki, you're saying cool, so you're in, you're going to try the challenge. Excellent. How about you, Susan? How about you, Luba? How about you, Keiko? Keiko is always my number one challenge taker. Yeah, it doesn't have to be too hard. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to make a long, but you know, you imagine you're a management consultant. So this is what you would tell Coca-Cola they need to do. So, so, so good, I, you know, some, some good ideas and why? What, what are the recommendations you're going to make? So I'll put this together in a document, shall I? And you will have about, you'll have until the end of the month. So until next week, let's say the 25th of May to complete the challenge and share it with everyone in the group in the same that way that those who've taken up the challenge before have done. Yeah, sound good? Well, if that's the case, great. I've only heard from Vasiliki. 
Nobody else is telling me whether it's a good idea. Susan, like you said, there's no smoke without fire. Yeah, very good idiomatic expression. No smoke without fire. Hey, thank you for that, Susan. I think I might make a video with that one. No smoke without fire. Yeah, nothing happens without a small grain of truth there. Something, yeah, you know, it's not just completely. Yeah, Luba. So this is, yeah, but this is a kind of task that I would give to my students. Exactly. So are you up to doing it yourself? Yeah. So this is um, something, yeah, because, I mean, the EWOT club is for predominantly business professionals who are looking to communicate better in their English. I know you're a, you're a fellow teacher, but you might have ideas on how you would present it. You know, sometimes we teachers, um, we think, oh gosh, um, I'm not going to, um, I don't know how I'd answer that. But maybe we should challenge ourselves and try it ourselves. And what would we advise um, our business professionals? You know, how, what would we advise Coca-Cola to do in this scenario? So, would you do that? Would you be into the challenge? You don't have to be. I will invite others to do the challenge. Great. Anyway, I hope we we talked about decisions, but more it was, you know, we looked at, at um, crisis management and looking at a crisis and we had some listening exercises in you answering questions. But what I was trying to do was also to lead it up to the next challenge here in the club. I hope um, that was enjoyable. That gave you some some ideas. Hey Saba, lovely to see you. We're almost at the end of the, the class, Saba. But hey Saba, you're another challenge taker. So I'm looking forward to you taking up the challenge, which I'll be posting in here. Um, if you want to listen to the recording of this lesson, that will tell you what it's all about. Um, okay, Luba, no, you're sorry you're too busy with something else at the moment. Sure, no problem. Yeah, urgent. Um, yeah, I know, no problem. Yeah, so Saba, so maybe you can take up the next challenge that we're doing, which is decision making, you being a management consultant, advising Coca-Cola on what to do to manage a crisis. Uh, great. Listen, thank you so much to all of you for uh, tuning in to today's class, Lesson 66, all about decision making, but in a, with, a different, with a twist, we're looking at how to, to manage a crisis and the decisions you're going to have to make in the next challenge here at on the EWOT Club. Anyway, thank you so much for tuning in. I will see you next week um, on the 23rd of May for Lesson 67. I hope you guys have a great weekend. We have a very busy weekend here in London, in the UK. Uh, you might know that Prince Harry is getting married on um, Saturday, so um, we're all going to be celebrating it with a street party. Um, so here where I live, it's quite quiet. So we're going to be having a street party. And also it's my birthday on um, Sunday. So I will be celebrating secretly. So, you know, I don't really want to, but, you know, I'll, I'll pretend, I'll pretend. So I'm very glad that Harry and Meghan have decided to get married just before my birthday. So, you know, I get to celebrate with them. And uh, so, yeah, so whatever you're doing at the weekend, I hope it's a wonderful time. Uh, I'll be posting this challenge and look forward to having as many of you joining this challenge and trying it out. Uh, it's all about decision making and I will see you next week. And uh, next week we'll be looking at negotiations. So again, trying our hand out at negotiating and what what makes an effective negotiator. And we'll, we'll look into more of that again next week. In the meantime, this is me, Shanti Kumaraswamy Street, your business English trainer here at EWOT, saying thanks so much for tuning in, guys. See you next week. Ciao for now.